everyone. My name is Miss Alyssa, and I'm here with a middle grade book tasting. Today, I'm going to be reading from the book Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park. I am reading this as a ebook through Overdrive. It is available as a physical book as well as an ebook and an audiobook through Overdrive. It is recommended for grades five through seven. It has a lexile of 730, and it is a level 5.2 for accelerated reader. So this book is actually written um, because the author loved reading Little House on the Prairie as a child, but Linda Sue Park wanted to see herself as a child in that story. Um, during the time of the Old West, there was definitely a lot of people who were there. There were Native Americans as well as many immigrants, including Chinese immigrants. The main character is a half Chinese young woman who um, is learning what it's like to live in the Old West with her father. It's going to start in the Dakota Territory, April 1880. One, should be our last day, Papa said when they stopped to make camp. He unhitched the tired horses from the wagon, then led them down a little draw to water, while Hannah began clearing the ground for a fire. They had journeyed for almost a month since leaving Cheyenne, their most recent stretch in near three years of travel. Three years without a real home. Tomorrow they would reach their destination, the Forge, a railroad town in Dakota Territory. Hannah was looking forward to cooking supper. They had been able to buy groceries in North Platte, but since then it had rained for almost a solid week. They'd had to make do with meal after meal of stale biscuit and cold beans. She had put dried codfish to soak that night before. Soup, she thought, with onions and potatoes. Papa returned with the horses and a bucket of water. He fastened the horses to their picket lines, then left again to gather some brushwood. I'm going to make soup, she told him when he returned to start the fire. About time we had a hot meal, he said. Hannah bristled at the note of petulance in his voice. The dreary weather of the past week was hardly her fault, but she said nothing, not wanting to start a row. Sky is clearing, he said. Maybe it'll be easier to scare up a rabbit or something. He went off with his gun on his arm, his long legged strides covering the ground quickly. Hannah watched him until he vanished behind a low rise. The endless prairie looked flat at first glance, but the land was never completely level. Rain had rinsed the gray and beige plans, plains, leaving behind a translu translucence of green that would grow that was growing denser every day. She went into the wagon and opened her trunk. She took out a piece of plain brown wrapping paper, a pencil, a rubber eraser, and a well-worn magazine. The paper had been folded accordion style several times and folded across twice, opened out the creases formed rectangles about two inches wide and three inches tall, three dozens of them. Hannah had used up about half the rectangles on one side of the paper, and each was a small pencil sketch of a dress, house dresses, visiting dresses, dresses for church, even ball gowns. She had seen pictures of ball gowns in the Godly's Ladies Book magazine, and it was fun to draw the elegant garments, even though she would never have a chance to see or wear one. Now she leafed through an issue of God Godies from last summer, the latest she had been able to get. On page after page, there were drawings of every kind of garment. Some were available ready-made for others, page patterns, and instructions to be mail-ordered. She found pictures of two gowns that interested her. She took up her pencil and began to draw, combining the bodice of one dress with the skirt of the other. She also added a trimming of braid around the cuffs and hem of the bodice. She eyed the drawing critically. Something wasn't right. The skirt was too full for the length of the bodice. She erased the skirt and drew it again. This time it was a slimmer profile. Yes, better. For the past three years, Hannah had done all the family sewing. Papa brought his coats and jackets. She made his trousers and overalls, shirts, drawers, and nightshirts, as well as her own dresses and undergarments. Using paper patterns that had belonged to Mama, she knew how to adjust measurements to the correct size. She could backstitch, whip stitch, sew buttonholes. When she hemmed a garment or added trimming, her stitches were nearly invisible. With all that experience behind her, she was confident that she could make a dress of her own design, and she intended to try very soon. She loved sketching because it took all her attention. She could stop thinking about the rest of the world for a while. As for sewing, most of the time it was both soothing and satisfying. 
She hadn't been able to draw or sew for several weeks now. Riding in the wagon, it was too bumpy for fine work, and by the time they stopped to camp, it was almost always too dark. Before long, she had to put away her drawing things to cook supper. She lifted the three-legged cast iron spider from its hook on one of the wagon bows. It was deep enough to make soup for two people. Spider in hand, she jumped to the ground, took a few steps, and stopped in mid-stride. A group of Indians stood in a loose semicircle between the wagon and the fire. Hannah had seen Indians in the wagon several times, but always at a distance. At such moments, Papa seemed watchful, but not particularly worried. He told her that the government had forced the Indians in this region, most of the members of the Sioux tribe, off the wide open prairie and onto tracts of land reserved for them. They were not allowed to leave that land without permission and from the reservation's Indian agent. Hannah looked over the group quickly. Three women, the eldest with gray streaked hair, a girl a few years younger than Hannah, and two little girls. The women were wearing faded blankets or shawls. They carried cloth sacks or bundles. One had a baby tied to her back. Mothers and daughters, Hannah thought at once, of Mama. What would she say or do if she were here? Hello, she said. I was just going to make soup. Would you like some? Mama had been a great believer in soup. She could conjure delicious soups from nothing but scraps and bones. She had taught Hannah the secret. One strongly flavored ingredient could make the whole pot of leftovers tasty. And you didn't need much of it. Dried mushrooms, cabbage, and garlic were all good. So was dried fish. Hannah used the big pot instead of the spider. She cut up the potatoes smaller than usual so they would cook more quickly. The Indians sat on the ground near the fire. Hannah was anxious to serve them, but she forced herself to wait until the potatoes were properly cooked through. She also found herself hoping that Papa wouldn't return any time soon. He might frighten them, or maybe the other way around. Hannah had enough spoons for her guests, but only four bowls. The oldest of the Sioux women seemed to be the group's leader. So Hannah served her first. She glanced down at the soup in her bowl, then looked up, pursed her lips, and motioned with her chin toward Hannah. Hannah understood at once. She wants to be sure that I eat, too. She filled two more bowls and handed them out for the rest of the group to share. The fourth bowl was for herself. She sat on the wagon steps to eat near the group, but not with them. The women talked quietly among themselves. Oyo wais, skuyas ni, mina ota min skuyas chin. Hannah wondered what they were saying, but at least she could tell that they were enjoying the soup. After the oldest woman tasted it, she said something to the others. Then another woman had a bite and said something else. They each took a second taste and had further conversation. It was just like Mama's friends in Chinatown, or the lady visitors at Miss Lorna's boarding house. They were talking about the soup, the ingredients, the flavor. By the end of the meal, the two little girls had grown brave enough to draw closer to Hannah. When she smiled at them, they shrieked in delight and ran back to the others. The women rose to leave. Their address, leader addressed Hannah. Waham pitin mina was nan pitamaya. Her voice was quiet as she nodded at Hannah. Hannah nodded back, hoping it was the right response. Mama always gave guests food to take home. She turned and hurried to the wagon, found an empty flour sack, and put in a few fistfuls of dry beans, then returned to her guests. She handed the sack to the gray-haired elder. The older woman turned and had a brief exchange with her companions. One of them reached into her bundle, pulled something out, and passed it to the leader. She held it at shoulder height. It dangled from her hand. It looked like a string of small white onions, or perhaps bulbs of garlic braided together by their stems. The old woman nodded at Hannah, then said something that sounded like, Timsina? She gave the braid a little shake. Timsina? Hannah repeated hesitantly. The little girls giggled and the woman smiled. Timsina, Anna said again, this time with more certainty. The old woman gave the braid to Hannah, who examined it with interest. The white tubers were clearly some kind of vegetable. The largest at the bottom were as big as ch child's fists. They tapered in size along the length of the braid, the smallest about the size of a walnut. She touched one of them. It was rock hard. They've been dried like what Mama used to do with mushrooms. She looked up to see the woman watching her closely. The woman pursed her lips again. This time she jerked her chin toward the kettle on the fire. It's as if she's pointing with her lips, Hannah thought. I cooked them in water, she asked. She pointed at the kettle. Shaking her head, the woman motioned toward the kettle again, and then toward the sky, tracing the path of the sun from east to west. She held up three fingers. 
three days, Hannah said. She can't pass the anemic system for three days. Kettle, water. Oh, I should soak them for three days before I cook them. She made an appropriate gesture as she spoke. The old woman smiled and nodded. Then she waved toward one of the empty soup bowls. Soak for three days and then use them in soup. At that, the old woman broke into murmurs of agreement, and the leader nodded again reprovingly. Thank you, Hannah said. Thank you for the cucina. The whole group laughed, and Hannah grinned at them. As the Indians departed, one of the little girls turned her head to stare at Hannah. Her eyes were very dark, almost black, and at the same time bright with curiosity. Hannah and the girl looked at each other for a long time, until the Indians disappeared beyond a rise in the prairie. Papa returned without any gain. Hannah told him about the visitors. Indians, he said with a frown. Women and girls, she said quickly. They gave me this. She showed him the braid. Prairie turnip, he said. Seen it before in Kansas. What did they taste like? Papa thought for a moment. Half turnip, half potato. Tasty enough, as I recall. A pause. Good thing you fed them. We wouldn't want any trouble. Hannah let a moment go by. She didn't want to sound impudent. Not even a hint of trouble, Papa. You can't be too careful when they don't keep their distance, he countered. Minnesota, the Black Hills, were smack in the middle between the two. She knew that Papa was talking about, for years there had been bloody skirmishes between the Indians and white people. Like many tribes, the Sioux had signed a treaty with the U.S. government promising that white settlers would not encroach on Indian land. Every single treaty had been broken by settlers or the government, or both. I don't blame them for fighting back, Hannah said. It's just not fair. That's not the point, Papa said. He made a wide sweep with his arm, almost a full circle. Most of the land around here used to be part of the Great Sioux Reservation. They left it as it was, all wild and unfarmed, so why shouldn't folks settle there? The land ought to go to people who work to improve it. That means farming, railroads, businesses, churches, schools. If you want those things, you gotta have somewhere to build them. Hannah did want those things. She especially wanted to go to school. She wondered why it wasn't possible for whites and Indians to share the land somehow. But she already knew from living in California that most white people didn't like having neighbors, Chinese, Indians, Mexicans, who weren't white themselves. Hannah wrapped the prairie turnips in a clean feed sack. Her next thought surprised her. They all had black hair. I haven't seen so many people with black hair since we left Chinatown in Salt Lake. She drew in a deep, a long breath. And there won't be any where we're going either. And that was the first chapter of Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park. Um, I really like this story because I like reading about the settlers and the Old West. I like learning about the wagon trains. And this would be a great book for anybody who has read Little House on the Prairie or similar books and really like them. I also really love how this book mentions um, many different people that were in the Old West and gives a slightly different story from what we usually hear makes it a lot more interesting and I get to learn a little bit more about our history while reading it. One thing to note is that throughout this story they do use the term Indians because that was how um, those people were known back at that time. Today we do call um, indigenous people Native Americans because that's the proper way to refer to them. Um, if you really like this book please let us know by emailing us at kids at lcplin.org. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. Bye.